you want some? Come get some. My name is My John name Cena. Is John and Cena? And I am right here. I do not back down from any challenge. I fear nothing and regret less. Love or hate, you cannot debate that I am in the center of sports entertainment, and I am surrounded by all of you. Ruthless aggression. This was the moment John Cena officially arrived in the WWE, June 27th, 2002, and what followed was one of the most legendary careers of all time, becoming a worldwide phenomenon and cementing his name among the greats with a body of work that goes so far beyond just accomplishments in the ring. But before we get to this day in June, we have to see how John Cena got here in the first place. John Cena was born in West Newberry, Massachusetts, and when he was born, he was fighting battles right from the start. His dad said that his umbilical cord was wrapped right around his neck three times around, and it was a really scary situation for him and his mom. But Cena, as always, fought through it, and on April 23rd, 1977, the legend we know today was born. John Cena's love of wrestling developed through his dad, who was a big fan of the business, and John Cena just gravitated towards it because of the larger than life characters. We've all seen the iconic picture of him holding the paper championship. And for Cena, growing up, he was a fan of wrestlers such as the Road Warriors, Hulk Hogan, and the Ultimate Warrior. He grew up with four brothers, and while watching wrestling, it was complete mayhem at the household. They just beat the living crap out of each other while it was on. Aside from wrestling, Cena had a love for sports. In fact, his grandfather, Tony Lupian, played Major League Baseball. But for Cena, things growing up weren't always just fun. He got beat up a ton. He didn't fit in, and all the kids were basically like, hey, why don't you dress like us? And John Cena was like, I don't want to dress like you. He was so immersed in hip-hop culture, and he said that he fully leaned into dressing as ridiculously as he possibly could, so then he would get beat up even more. He didn't care what people thought about him, and to combat bullying, he asked for some weights at age 12, something that his dad would get him for Christmas. And from here, his love of bodybuilding took off. When Cena was out of high school, he attended Springfield College and he played football. The position, center. The number, of course, 54. But he never considered football as a viable option because he thought he was too small and his head was in the bodybuilding game. He graduated with a degree in exercise physiology and when he left college, he had aspirations of becoming a bodybuilder, something he moved to California to do as there would be more opportunity there. But for Cena, it was really tough. In California, he was living out of his 1991 Lincoln Continental because he didn't have enough money for an apartment. At the same time, he was working at a gold gym to make ends meet. He'd work shifts from 4 a.m. to midnight, and in between, he'd take advantage of the weights that were available. Also, he appeared in a gold gym commercial and as an uncredited extra in the movie Ready to Rumble. And it was one day working out in that same Gold's Gym where he was approached by former WWF wrestler Mike Belt. He looked at Cena's physique and he told him to try out Ultimate Pro Wrestling which was WWE developmental at the time. So Cena gave it a shot. He went to UPW and he started training. He developed his character named The Prototype. 50% man, 50% machine, and 100% mayhem. It was a mix of a cyborg and a robot. Still new to the business, Cena was trained by Christopher Daniels and Mike Bell, and when he went to UPW, he told his dad that it just felt right. It felt like he should be here. While in UPW, he became the UPW heavyweight champion, and he wrestled there all the way until 2001. 2001 was where he was signed by Jim Ross to Ohio Valley Wrestling. Here they trained superstars to learn the WWE style in hopes of a TV debut for the company. And when Cena went to OVW, he joined a legendary class of talent that would include Randy Orton, Batista, and Brock Lesnar. Jim Ross has been credited with signing Cena and he said that Cena as a human was very respectful, very hardworking, and had a good attitude. But in the ring, he was really green, meaning that his skills were not very strong. The work ethic came from his days playing football where teammates would rave about him being the first person on the field and the last off of it. When it came to character work and having a commanding on-air presence, Cena was a complete natural. Jim Ross told Vince McMahon that he just signed his main event in 5 years time. But Vince laughed. Vince was very critical of Cena because he looked like he was juiced up and he wanted nothing to do with him. 
To his surprise, Cena was completely clean. So some time passed and WWE took notice of Cena's work in OVW. He started to work some dark matches, house shows, and on the sea shows like Velocity, Sunday Night Heat, and Jacked. And it's also important to remember that at this time, Vince McMahon was ushering in the Ruthless Aggression era. Vince in late June asked, who has it within them? Who has that one quality? Who has enough ruthless aggression to step up and become the company's next top star? The company was coming out of the red hot attitude era and now stars like Stone Cold and The Rock were gone. They needed a new nucleus of talent and poetically enough, just a few days later, John Cena would make his debut. That brings us full circle to the slap. Cena said that this match came together because there was no one else to wrestle Kurt. It was supposed to be Undertaker, but Undertaker was sick. Also, he said that the first orders he ever got from Vince McMahon were to go get a haircut. So after the haircut, Cena marched down the ramp, looking like probably the most generic wrestler ever. They got rid of the prototype gimmick, which Bruce Prichard and Vince McMahon didn't like, and they gave him his real name. John Cena. And there he was. He stepped up to Kurt Angle and Angle asked what qualities Cena possessed to hang with the very best in the business. Cena iconically said ruthless aggression before slapping Kurt in the face. The match got underway and Kurt has gone on record to say that he wanted to blow up Cena throughout the match. He wanted to push him through the paces but John just kept coming back for more and this really showed that he could hang. The match did end in a Cena loss, but he had arrived. After this, they legitimized him a little bit more by having The Undertaker shake John Cena's hand in a backstage segment, and you would have thought he's getting everything handed right to him that there's no way this can fail. But they could have legitimized him as much as they wanted, he just wasn't clicking with the crowd. He would just come out and smile, and he had no character whatsoever. His biggest character trait was to color coordinate his ring gear with the city he was performing in. Detroit? Alright, Red Wings colors. Boston? Alright, Celtic it is just bland boring and not interesting just as quick as things started by late 2002 his career was in huge danger he beat chris jericho at vengeance 2002 for his first ever pay-per-view win and again you would have thought that because this rookie is beating a guy who just main evented wrestlemania a few months ago that this guy was in for big things but it was quite the opposite John Cena describes this period as the biggest failure in his career. The connect to Vince McMahon's ruthless aggression promo and the slap, everything was right there. It was basically handed to him, but he himself said that he failed to move things forward. Cena said that around late November, WWE used to make talent cuts and he was told that he was going to be getting his release because it just wasn't working. He wasn't what they were looking for and people like Vince McMahon and Triple H wanted him gone. Cena was on what he believed to be his last European tour and on the back of the bus were Rikishi and Rey Mysterio. They were just freestyling, just goofing around to kill some time and Cena went, hey, I'm going to go join in. Let's see where this leads me. And to everyone's surprise, John Cena was insanely talented at freestyle rapping. He made everybody laugh, and at the front of the bus was Stephanie McMahon. She was the creative director of SmackDown at the time, and she's like, hey, how'd you remember that? And Cena told her that he just made it up on the fly. Stephanie, impressed with Cena's ability to think fast, asked him to do it again by rapping about a can of tuna. And then she was so impressed that she went, all right, do this on TV. So now fate had given Cena a second chance before he would have been fired altogether. And now the slow transformation to the Doctor of Thugonomics had begun. The gimmick debuted on the Halloween edition of SmackDown where John Cena dressed up as Vanilla Ice and slowly Cena was changing and so was his presentation. He started to come out in bucket hats and he was playing off rap culture at the time which he followed really closely. Cena would come to the ring rapping about the most nonsensical things you could think about. Even though his character wasn't supposed to go very far, Cena got it to go far because it was so different from everything else that it just worked. His raps about illegal immigration, about controversies going on around the world, him dissing his opponents meshed with his brash confidence was a recipe for success. The outfit set him apart and everything was starting to fall into place. He started to challenge people like Rikishi and Los Guerreros on SmackDown. Nothing too major, but it gave him a chance to remain on the card. Then Cena started to call out guys like Brock Lesnar. The same Brock Lesnar who hit John Cena with an F5 into the ring post. So when John Cena returned, he adapted the F5 and he changed the name to the FU which would later become the Attitude Adjustment. At 2003's WrestleMania 19, he was set to have a rap battle against Jay-Z and Fabulous but they didn't make the event. The segment got cut and he instead rapped to cardboard cutouts. 
Following WrestleMania 19, he fought Brock Lesnar for the WWE title, but he'd go on to lose. He continued to face the very best on SmackDown, guys like Undertaker and Eddie Guerrero, and look where he was now. He just had funny rap battles, and you saw him grow. You really saw Cena come into his own. It was authentic, it was real, and it wasn't forced. Sometimes you can see when guys are just playing a character. This just felt like an extension of John Cena. In late 2003, after a heel run, he turned face on the Road to Survivor Series, joining Team Angle, and now it was onwards and upwards for John Cena. He began to be treated as a huge deal because he was one. They didn't force him too much, and when Cena left, it's almost like the fans wanted more. Cena would make people laugh and his hand signals and way of dressing in retro jerseys and jorts started to get mimicked by the fans. But what people loved so much was he would come out to the ring, he would diss people, he would be inappropriate. Then at the end of his raps, he would say something controversial that you just weren't allowed to say on TV and the audience would scream it at the top of their lungs. He was just naturally cool and his rhymes were something that nobody could adjust to. People were getting flat out roasted by John Cena. With the rapper gimmick, Paul Heyman believed that this was going to shoehorn Cena into something that he would never recover from, and to say the least, he was wrong. By early 2004, he was being groomed to be a key player. He made it into the final six of the Royal Rumble, and when he didn't win that, he instead turned his sights to the Big Show and the US title. At WrestleMania 20, the reaction for Cena was huge. He'd go on to capture his first singles title, and on that same night was when Brock Lesnar departed the WWE. Brock Lesnar was the guy that WWE was putting all their chips behind, and and for a bunch of different reasons out of the control of WWE, he left the company. Now Vince was forced to go back to the drawing board and see who was going to carry this company forward. We'll come back to that one in a bit, but for John Cena, he had a really good year. The Doctor of Thugonomics was in full swing and he got the phrase word life over big time. It should also be noted that during this time in 2004, John Cena was working on his debut rap album called You Can't See Me. The You Can't See Me was something that John Cena did and it just took off. It became iconic. The origins of it was that his brother was listening to his music and giving him feedback and he did a Tony Yayo dance from a G-Unit video where he bobbed his head behind his hand and it looked completely ridiculous. So ridiculous that his brother dared him to do it on TV. Cena adapted it and he turned it into the You Can't See Me, meaning that no one was on his level. And now thousands of people were waving their hands in front of their face pretending to be invisible. They were putting the W's up in the air with John Cena and that move, it's simply iconic. Even though it might be a Tony Yayo dance, it belongs to John Cena. Cena would pump up his Reeboks before hitting a move called the FU. And honestly, how could you not love a badass like this? He was in music videos with the rapper Murs, he got recognition from Method Man on a WWE magazine, he was rapping for video games and energy drink commercials, and as early as 2004, John Cena had gone mainstream. Also at the end of 2004, he was moving away from the Doctor of Thugonomics gimmick and changing into Chain Gang Cena, still keeping a lot of that coolness but in a full babyface capacity. Throughout 2004, he stayed in the mid card, but his reactions were getting so, so loud. His fan base was getting huge. And he won the US title three times in this year. He feuded with guys like Booker T, Carlito, and Rene Dupree. And it was the third win where John Cena introduced the Spinner US title. He wanted to add his own creativity and flair to the design and kids started to love it. It was made for John Cena's outlandish character. Near the end of the year, WWE seeing Cena's potential had him star in the movie Marine, something he left WWE to film in 2004. And in storyline, he got stabbed. I honestly can't believe that this was the best way they could write him off was to be stabbed. Following the return, he captured the aforementioned third US title and in early 2005, his ascent to the top began. This was also where he started to grant make-a-wishes. Back in 2002, he told the company, hey, if you ever need me, I'm right here. Cena believed in using your position for good, but at the time, look at this guy. Who would have wanted a make-a-wish from this dude? Come three years later and he was on the verge of global fame that no one could have imagined. You know how I told you guys that Vince was back to the drawing board on who his next top star was going to be? Well, the two names on that board were Dave Bautista and John Cena. Even Vince was still trying to figure out who it was going to be. At the 2005 Royal Rumble, Cena made it to the final two, but he got eliminated by Batista. His road to the top wouldn't end there though. Cena beat Kurt Angle to win a number one contenders tournament to face JBL for the WWE title at WrestleMania 21. The Renegade was out and he was wild. This was what people loved about Cena. He would vandalize JBL's limo, how fitting that a former limo driver hates limos, 
and he was just a badass. Everyone loved the antics and the badass that Cena was. And as you'll come to see later on, slowly this started to get stripped away. Come WrestleMania 21, Cena got his crowning moment, and how fitting, year 3, here he was, at the top of the mountain, the WWE Champion, where things could have gone so, so horribly wrong, there he stood, holding the biggest prize in the industry. Post Mania, it became glaringly obvious that Cena was the guy. His merch was going like crazy, and to add to that, he debuted one of the hottest selling pieces of merchandise in WWE history, the Spinner WWE Championship. A concept he came up with himself, but there were a lot of fans that weren't too happy with WWE's top prize, spinning. Years later, Cena would reveal that this would become the most sold and sought after title in company history. The Spinner, of course, was also the cover of Cena's album, which was about to drop in May of 2005. This project had 17 songs on it, all written and recorded by John Cena and his cousin The Trademark. Initially, 85 songs were recorded for the album, but only 17 made it onto the CD. The album debuted at number 15 on the Billboard charts, selling 143,000 copies its first week, and it went platinum. Wrap your mind around just how insane that is. A WWE wrestler who wrote a rap album went platinum. The album also featured what would become his iconic theme song called The Time Is Now. When people hear that, either they cheer or they boo or they just don't care. But one of the words you hear in the first few seconds is the word Amadou. Amadou is reference to Amadou Diallo who was killed at age 23 in 1999. The killing caused national outrage because Diallo was innocent but he got gunned down in New York. The opening riff was sampled from the song Anti Up by M.O.P. and Cena really badly wanted this sound effect to be the kickoff for his song. Maybe he thought it just got people hyped. Also in the time is now, the trumpets you hear are from a song called The Night The Lights Went Out In Georgia which released in 1974. So now maybe that'll clear up some of the confusion of what's said at the beginning of his song. The company were so invested in Cena that they changed their championship. They gave John Cena press releases, they promoted his music videos, and his incoming fame was unfathomable three years ago. It was onwards and upwards for John Cena. He was everywhere. He was not only building a brand for himself and his company but also being a great community ambassador for the youth and the US military. Cena had arrived and he was here to stay, but not on SmackDown. Cena was drafted over to what the company portrayed as their number one show, Monday Night Raw. He was the number one overall pick in the 2005 WWE Draft, and here he would perform his music live and he would get into feuds during the fall and summer with Chris Jericho and Kurt Angle. During the Angle feud, he added the STF as a finishing submission, and look at him, here he was against the guy who he started things off with, now the WWE Champion. But the John Cena people loved was quickly changing. Cena endeared himself to the fan base because of his no Fs given persona, his raps, his anti-establishment attitude, but when he made the move over to Raw, booze started to seep into his performances as many fans weren't liking that essentially he was being stripped of his authenticity. He was shedding off what fans fell in love with in the first place, and for some fans, his in-ring abilities were something that left a lot to be desired. Don't get me wrong, he was still a huge deal, but the split we'd eventually see with his character began as early as mid-2005. Too much, too soon may be the right way to put it. He, as the hero in storylines, would get light booze against Chris Jericho and Kurt Angle. But, as always, he persisted through it. In early 2006, John Cena competed in a grueling Elimination Chamber match at New Year's Revolution. And on this night, the hero would meet his ultimate villain. That being Edge. Edge cashed in the money in the bank on John Cena and he ended Cena's first title reign at 280 days. And these two would forever be linked together, over the next decade putting on not only some great matches, but giving audiences a timeless rivalry which will forever be seen as one of the most personal and entertaining. Three weeks later, Cena picked the title right back up from Edge, and this added a lot more fuel to the fire for Cena's detractors. Heading into WrestleMania 22, he feuded with Triple H, who in the grand scheme of things was supposed to be the bad guy, but the resentment towards Cena continued. The company was now reaping the rewards of John Cena, from his merge to the Spinner Championship and his natural media skills. The company sent him everywhere. He articulated well, he brought the brand to a wider audience, he understood how to promote. John Cena was simply taking over at this point. 
WrestleMania 22 comes, Cena beats Triple H to retain the WWE title and then would later go on to drop the title to RVD at One Night Stand 2006, where saying John Cena got a hostile reaction would be the understatement of the year. They booed him into oblivion and there was even a sign that said if Cena wins we riot. Cena in a matter of a year had gone from a universally beloved figure by children, adults and probably even grandmothers to a polarizing star whose reaction would now be split. One side saying let's go Cena and another simply Cena sucks. But Cena did not waver. His character was now fully an American patriot following the release of his first movie The Marine and despite popular belief, Cena was actually never in the military. He had a huge respect for them so he'd make a salute on his way down to the ring. Cena and Edge continued their rivalry throughout 2006 and Cena won back the WWE title at Unforgiven in Edge's hometown of Toronto. This would begin a 380 day WWE title reign in which he'd face whoever would step up to him. He put on great matches with the likes of Umaga, Shawn Michaels who he faced at WrestleMania 23. Even though the initial plan was to do a rematch with Triple H, Triple H got injured and this was a blessing in disguise. He won the tag team titles with Michaels and then he and HBK had a 50 minute epic in London. An amazing fatal 4 way at Backlash, he somehow helped Khali have great matches, he took on Bobby Lashley and then he'd meet another man who helped define his career. A man who he'd forever be linked to, the menace himself. Randy Orton. These two had a vicious rivalry, it was personal, it was vile, it was at times uneasy viewing and arguably the two biggest stars in the company had now finally met. They were set to face off at No Mercy 2007 but John Cena in a match against Mr. Kennedy, Kennedy injured his shoulder, he tore his right pectoral right off the bone, went on to win and even took a post match beatdown but he was forced into surgery and just like that his title reign came to an end. The longest title reign in nearly 20 years at that point, gone just like that. Cena had now suffered the first big setback of his career. At a time where his charitable work was starting to take off, this was a huge blow to the WWE. I'll touch on his amazing work in the community near the end of the video because that needs a full breakdown, but now we gotta talk about something not as happy, something a little bit more grim. The unfortunate events of 2007. June 2007 was where Chris Benoit was involved in a double murder suicide, taking the life of himself, his son Daniel and his wife Nancy. WWE because of this was in a PR nightmare. They had had their fair share of controversies and this did not help them one bit. Many families started to distance themselves from the WWE and they didn't want their children associating with a product that was this barbaric. So the company decided to make a move. They were going to change from TV 14 to PG and they wanted to go true PG. They no longer wanted to tow that line of borderline uncalled for moments and instead they wanted to show everyone that WWE was for families and what happened didn't reflect the values of the company. A rebase line was made and at the forefront of that would be the poster boy, John Cena. WWE was now officially catering to young fans and families. And I will say this, that Vince McMahon is a pretty wild dude, but he knows when he has a cash cow on his hands and no one milks one better than Vince. John Cena for the company was ready to take multiple flights across the country every week. He was ready to put in those 17, 18 hour workdays for the brand, for the company. He wanted to usher in this new time frame and he didn't have a problem with being the poster boy. Vince saw that and he took a calculated approach with Cena's merch. He gave him merch of every variety, he made him do media which would not only show that WWE was good but also help John Cena grow his name. This not only got them into the good graces of the public but it also helped WWE make a bigger global expansion. Cena was so invested that he said that he learned Mandarin so that the company could expand into a market like China. The ultimate good guy who had a connection with the kids that was unmatched, similar to Hulk Hogan. This iteration of Cena would be known as Super Cena. But through these videos I also like to give you guys an idea of the character. And I also like to give you both sides. I gave you the money cash cow side and how Vince was making him basically manufactured. There's also another side to this. At this time a sentiment started to grow that he was becoming too manufactured. For adults and teenagers it became tiresome because the Cena character had no flaws. It never failed and it was a very copy paste formula. Between 2009 and 2014, 
Those were arguably his most unsufferable years. But now that you know where his character was at this point, it's time to get back to his timeline of events. It was January 27th, 2008, and John Cena was nowhere to be found, still on the shelf with a torn pectoral. Time was winding down on the 2008 Royal Rumble, and we were ready to see who the last entrant would be. And then, in a shock to everyone, the time is now hit and out came John Cena to a massive reception. Even the most cynical New York fan couldn't help but cheer Cena on. He came in, he cleaned house, and he won his first ever Royal Rumble. He was taking his trumpets to Florida for WrestleMania 24 to face off against Randy Orton and Triple H for the WWE title, but he wouldn't see championship success just yet. Throughout the spring, Cena brought it full circle with a feud with JBL, and then the stars aligned even more in the summer when Batista and John Cena had a proper rivalry. Cena ended up losing that match at SummerSlam, and now he'd suffer another setback. A herniated disc in his neck, and this would keep him out of action for three months. Cena then returned in his hometown of Boston for Survivor Series. He beat Chris Jericho, and for the first time in his career, he captured the World Heavyweight Championship. And take a wild guess who he lost this title to. Of course, it was Edge. Now we were in 2009 and the product was really different. Cena's catchphrases started to get marketed really, really heavy. Never give up, hustle, loyalty, respect, you want some, come get some. The guy who had been bullied as a kid was now using his platform for good. He started to appear in mainstream media, even more talk shows, interviews, press tours, TV cameos, magazines, books, posters, merch of every variety. You name it, Cena was doing it. His mainstream reach was about to get to astronomical heights. He had started to begin his ascent from WWE superstar to worldwide phenomenon, but business was still in the ring. At WrestleMania 25, John Cena won back the World Heavyweight Championship, and for the rest of the year, he'd instead trade back the WWE title with Randy Orton. These two picked up the rivalry from 07. By year's end, he'd lose the title to newcomer Sheamus, and now his accomplishments were starting to pile up. By the end of 2009, he captured seven world titles in total. At 2010's Elimination Chamber, John Cena won his eighth world title, and heading into WrestleMania 26, he was facing off and continuing his feud with Batista. They picked it right back up again. This time, Cena would come out on top, capturing the WWE title. These two would feud throughout the spring, and after Batista left the company to pursue other ventures, WWE was getting really depleted of talent. Shawn Michaels, retired. Triple H, part-time. Undertaker, part-time. Batista, now gone. A lot of those talents from the prime Ruthless Aggression years, they were gone. There were basically three guys left, Orton, Edge, and Cena. Well, a new act would enter the company known as The Nexus. The Nexus was a group of rebellious rookies who made it their mission to go after the top guy in the company, and that was John Cena. They were red hot heading into SummerSlam 2010, but at that event, Cena pinned Team Nexus and their momentum was stunted. This is something that's lived on in wrestling circles as Cena essentially ruining the group. The latter part of 2010 saw Cena feud with the Nexus and even have to join the group at one point. At the head of it all was Wade Barrett, a new star who looked like he was destined for success, but he too ended up falling victim to Cena. We're now in 2011, nearly a decade into John Cena's career, but you all know before John Cena, there was another guy who dominated. Another guy who was on the posters, he was selling merch, and he helped WWE grow their audience. Of course, I'm talking about The Rock. Rock was now a full-blown Hollywood superstar. He returned to the WWE to guest host WrestleMania 27, but the reality was he was coming back to set up a match with John Cena. At WrestleMania 27, the main event was basically a setup to the following year's WrestleMania, where the company for the first time in their history announced a match a full year in advance. John Cena vs The Rock. Two bona fide superstars, one on one. These two did not like each other. They had legitimate hatred, and it came from John Cena being annoyed at what The Rock represented. The Rock said that this is all that he ever wanted to do, but the first chance he had, he left for the movie business and he left the company high and dry. So there was legit animosity between these two. Cena captured World Championship number 10 at Extreme Rules 2011, and then Cena would meet an emerging star. With the roster depleted, as I mentioned, CM Punk rose through the ranks. A contract dispute caused him to catch fire in the summer of 2011. The man with the five moves of doom that many people were clamoring to have dethroned 
finally had the perfect setup guy on the other end. Real quick, the dynamic here was basically the machine versus the anti-authority figure. It was the hottest angle that the company had ran in years. This led us to Money in the Bank, where Cena walked into yet another hostile reaction. Cena's highest rated match of all time. He would drop the title to CM Punk at Money in the Bank before winning it back just a few weeks later to Rey Mysterio. CM Punk would return and we'd find ourselves in a situation with two WWE champions. So an undisputed WWE title match was made for SummerSlam 2011 and in between the build up for The Rock and John Cena continued. At SummerSlam, Cena would lose the title to CM Punk before winning it a short while later from Alberto Del Rio, now giving him 12 world championships in WWE but he lost it just a month later. By year's end, Cena and Rock would team up at the 2011 Survivor Series, and the following year, it was time. John Cena's merchandise was still flying off the shelves. They could have put his face or logo onto anything and it would have sold. Cena was the busiest he'd ever been at that point, but the cry for his character to change was something that continued throughout the year. His good guy character opened up a ton of new opportunities for the WWE to remain in the mainstream media, something that probably should have ended when Stone Cold and The Rock left. And now those events of 2007 weren't looked at anymore. This was the face of a now global industry, but it was time for the match. Megastar vs Megastar, April 1st, 2012, it was labeled once in a lifetime, never happened before, never to happen again. John Cena and The Rock, WrestleMania 28. They had a match so big that it broke all types of pay-per-view buy rates. It broke merch records and who knows what else. But unfortunately, John Cena would go on to lose this match. This was because business was so good that they wanted to build to a rematch the following year. And now the company focused on telling the story of John Cena's downward spiral, saying that this was the worst year in his career. He wrestled a returning Brock Lesnar who he ended up beating, he captured the money in the bank for the first time in his career, and he became involved in some really random feuds, one with John Laurinaitis, and I think it is safe to say that this was one of John Cena's messiest years. He had an undeniable presence to him where half the crowd would chant let's go Cena and the other half Cena sucks. The company used to say that this was emotion being drawn from the crowd unlike any other. Cena had become so polarizing that wherever he went, you would hear kids chant let's go Cena where the opposite end would just say get out of my screen man. Some people legitimately wanted this man dead. They hated him. They were so sick and tired of the Superman act that they would have rather had anyone else. Come 2013, he won his second career Royal Rumble and on that same night, The Rock captured the WWE title off CM Punk, so now it was time to run it back. Cena, Rock, Part 2. This time, it would be Cena taking the win and winning his 13th world title. The match didn't do the same amount of numbers as the first go around, but it was still a huge deal. The subsequent title reign led him to SummerSlam 2013 where he'd lose it to Daniel Bryan, clean in the ring, 1-2-3. He went out to go get tricep surgery, but of course, he returned again. One thing that cannot be glossed over about John Cena's career is the work ethic. Even when he got injured, he came back in record time and he continued to wrestle in high level matches. When he wasn't on TV, he was working dark matches, and when he wasn't doing that, he was making wishes come true. John Cena during his tenure in the WWE focused on checking off as many boxes as possible. He wanted to reach as far as he could. Whether that was make a wishes for the kids, whether it was stopping by to see someone seeing their final days, or whether it was just using his message to leverage for good. He did this without hoping for media attention. Up until this point, he's granted 650 plus Make-A-Wishes for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and he's always the most requested person for that company. He was the model for how to treat people. He was one of the busiest people on the planet, and I can't hammer these two points home enough. One was the work ethic, and the second of just how good a human being he is. After surgery, he returned to capture the World Heavyweight Championship from Alberto Del Rio. This led us to a unification match between Randy Orton, which he would go on to lose, 
In 2014, he entered a rivalry with the up-and-coming Bray Wyatt, a rivalry which he would go on to win. Later in the year, he captured World Championship number 15, getting him very close to the all-time record set by Ric Flair. In the summer, he met Brock Lesnar, and Cena got absolutely mauled. He lost the title, he got in no offense in that match, and through the end of 2014, he had rivalries with Seth Rollins and The Authority. That brought us to 2015. This is the year where he'd take a step back to let WWE's next generation come into full swing. He captured the US title for the fourth time in his career, and honestly, he had an iconic late career resurgence which nobody in their right mind could have expected. Throughout this video, I've made sure to tell you about the state of Cena's character and how fans responded to him. And those same people who had a disdain for Cena's character started to actually cheer him. He added new moves to his repertoire, he had a laundry list of great matches with the likes of Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, Cesaro and so many others. And the US Open Challenge version of John Cena became iconic. He continued to prove why he was still the best in the business. He lost the title to Seth Rollins at SummerSlam 2015 and then picked it up a month later at Night of Champions. This brought his US title reigns to 5. Come year's end, he left to go get shoulder surgery, dropping the title to Alberto Del Rio. It was 2015 where his popularity somehow exploded even more as he became the bud of an internet meme, you know. And his name is John Cena! Yeah, that one. Because of this, John Cena's name grew in the eyes of the casual consumer. But as he was growing, he was slowly going. He let others take the spotlight, and now he was making the move into Hollywood. But this wouldn't be his last full-time run. The last full-time run he had would be 2016, where he'd again meet a wrestling soulmate essentially in AJ Styles. These two put on a fantastic rivalry where AJ Styles would go up two wins to nothing. But Cena... He would do it. He tied Ric Flair's record of 16 world titles and he cemented himself as one of the greatest. This moment was huge. This is something that we may never see again in this company. Someone remaining relevant for that long and winning 16 world titles. He lost the title just a month later lobbying hard for Bray Wyatt to win the championship and from here appearances became more spaced out. He would have some feuds throughout 2017 and he'd be juggling back and forth between Hollywood and the WWE, also putting over WWE's new top guy Roman Reigns. Cena would pop up now and then for the occasional rivalry against The Undertaker and some here and there, but his days as a full-time performer were over. Hollywood wasn't calling but screaming his name, and in Hollywood, his popularity blew up even more. He already had a great foundation of work in the WWE, and then in the movie business, he built it up even more. He became one of the most well-renowned actors on the face of the planet. He'd have short feuds with the likes of Bray Wyatt, and then as the pandemic was settling down, he made an iconic return at Money in the Bank 2021. He returned to face Roman Reigns at SummerSlam and definitively put him over as WWE's next top star. And with that, he proved his words true. He really does love coming back at every chance he gets. And now John Cena is very much so in the entertainment sphere. His role in Peacemaker has brought some fantastic reviews as critics have given him really high praise. And now, here we stand 20 years after his debut. In the burgeoning internet era, Cena became one of the biggest stars on the face of the planet. Through 15 years, he not only remained relevant, but he remained the top guy in the company. His work is a microcosm of who John Cena is as a person. But what is his legacy? Cena in his album has a song called If It All Ended Tomorrow. Well, what would we say if it all ended tomorrow? Cena in his career has wrestled over 2,000 matches. He's been on over 160 pay-per-views. He's one of two wrestlers to ever have 10 plus WrestleMania wins. And he's left an indelible mark on the industry. There was no reason for him to go as hard as he did. He could have coasted through things, no problem. He could have stood on his name alone, but he didn't do that. He made it his mission to carry the WWE through thick and thin, to carry WWE's flag high. He achieved global superstardom that no one in the company has matched since. And honestly, if you think someone's matched that level of superstardom, I hate to tell you this, but you are completely wrong. 
It's almost like something is missing for many. He brought an unrivaled level of importance to the company. His fame can be understated, but not overstated. He defined two separate eras in the company. He made the company money, he gave you a reason to tune in, he was polarizing, he had the audience split, but that's not really his legacy. His legacy is so much more than that. His impact is most felt outside the ring. One of the most prolific celebrity stars ever. When so many will shy away from the WWE, he holds that logo as close to his heart as he can. Cena has worked with Make-A-Wish, the Boys and Girls Club of America, the Kids Wish Network, and so many other places to shine a spotlight on good in a world that sometimes seems all evil. His impact on WWE's new generation continues to be seen, and for a generation of fans, this is the guy. This is the guy that they're forever latched onto. Nothing will meet the excitement of seeing John Cena, one of the industry's biggest draws. I know my job is to somehow tell you a decent story, but there's four guys in this industry that words are not enough to describe their impact. John Cena, Hulk Hogan, The Rock, and Stone Cold. John Cena created a whole new generation of wrestling fans, and I know what I'm about to say may sound corny to some of you, but it's true. Cena is a beacon of light. His simple yet very complex message to never quit in the hardest of times has helped more people than will ever meet our eyes. He is the model of consistency, respect, and gratitude towards others. This video may have helped you learn a little bit more, but it does not do justice to the enormity of his body of work, the enormity of his star presence, and just how much, I don't even know what to say, just how much he ran shit. A natural born entertainer and a leader who built a legacy unlike any other. For two decades, the man who can't be seen has shown himself to the entire world more than any figure in this industry. When all is said and done and John Cena is actually nowhere to be seen, his career will live on forever. His rise is one of chance, one of a guy getting an opportunity, and then when that opportunity came, he didn't just take it and sit with it, he scorched the ground trying to take the company as far as he could. There's people who don't even know the name WWE if not for John Cena. That's the first thing they think of when they see this logo. There's very few left for him to accomplish in his career, but what he did, the legion of fans he has, the fact that many consider him to be the greatest of all time, it's unfathomable to put into words. The days of seeing John Cena on a weekly basis are gone, and as time winds down, the day where he makes his final salute is coming sooner rather than later. Those days may be gone, but his career is an anomaly, a body of work many wish to achieve, and a legacy that's simply unmatched. As the WWE signature suggests, his career is timeless. One that will live on then, now, and when he leaves this earth behind, forever.